Thank you. It's great to be here. And this is a great way to spend a cozy, rainy Saturday, I think, talking about books, especially one um, that is a book all about fall and apple orchards. And so it seems like just the right time to do this. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of background about the writing process and about this book in particular. I see some of you are holding it. So hopefully I have some some readers in the room who maybe are, I know people who are even maybe in the middle of it have already read it. So I like to talk about um, how this book kind of came from seed to story. So if you think about an apple seed and how it's this tiny little seed that grows into hopefully a tree that bears fruit, that's a little bit how this story took um, root in my own life. So just a little bit about me. Um, I am from, from Michigan, um, about two and a half hours from here, um, closer to Grand Rapids. And I work as a secondary literacy consultant, which basically means I get to hang out with kids and teachers and talk about reading a lot. And um, I taught eighth grade for about 15 years. And um, I have an MFA in creative writing, which I'll talk a little bit about how I had to go back and be a student to be able to write this book. And then I'm a mom to three boys and a daughter of apple farmers, which you can probably tell by reading the book. So Enemies in the Orchard is a World War II novel in verse, and it just came out um, September 12th, so just under a month ago. It's been an exciting journey for me. Um, and so I think about how oftentimes, maybe even in school, some of you have heard your teachers talk about having a seed story in your head, like just a tiny little seed that grows. And so I, as I mentioned, that's what I'm going to kind of focus on a bit. So um, my grandfather had an apple orchard and um, he actually managed it. He didn't own it, but my dad and his, all his siblings grew up on this apple orchard. So I grew up, mo this is me as a, a three or four year old. Uh, most of my life I spent in the trees, especially on days like today, on, on Saturdays with my grandpa picking apples. And um, I really wanted to learn more about the history of my family's farm. So way back when I was in college, which was about 20 years ago, I had a class and I decided to um, interview my family and learn about our family's orchard. So I wrote this book called Family Trees. Here's some pictures of my, my grandpa's orchard. If you've read the book, you know there's some scenes where it talks about an apple-shaped sign that's at the entrance of the orchard that was based on my grandpa's orchard, which had this little sign. Here's my grandpa on a tractor with my uncle Randy when he's very young. My, my, my grandpa's passed away now. And then some workers on the orchard. So what happened to me was when I was in college, I wanted to find out the story of my family and the, especially about the orchard. So I interviewed my dad and he mentioned to me a story I had never heard before, which is that there were German prisoners of war who came to Michigan during the war and worked on farms and picked apples like my grandpa's that were really that that was 20 years ago back in 1998 when I first heard that story and I'll admit as a college student it, it was kind of just a small kind of seed that was planted in my head but I didn't really research it any further in fact if you look at um this was maybe a 10 12 page um project I did it just took up one little paragraph where I mentioned that during World War II German prisoners of war were stationed near Grand Rapids and they came and worked in my grandpa's orchard. So I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. Um, I taught eighth grade as I said, I, I was a middle school teacher for a long time and I had this dream deep within me that I wanted to write a book. So I decided to go back to class. I um, enrolled in writing classes um, in a program where I had to um, send 20 to 30 pages of writing every six weeks or so. And I tried to write an essay about my those German prisoners. And I started to do a little bit of research about them. But the more that I researched, the more I realized maybe this wasn't going to be an essay, like a very serious nonfiction essay. This was part from, from part of my first draft. I decided maybe I need to give myself a new assignment. And instead I need to tell this as a story. So the, what really got me thinking and working on this book was once I started to do all of the research, this is a book called Michigan POW Camps in World War II. It's by Greg Sumner. And I found this book and I started to read it. And I was fascinated by the stories of the German prisoners who were captured and then brought back to our country. I was fascinated with this idea that we could have like the enemy troops 
in our own backyard while many of the families had kids fighting in Europe in the war. So here's a picture um, during the World War II. This is a fact that not very many adults know either. There were over 6,000 prisoners housed in 32 prisoner of war camps all over our state. So if you look at this map, it shows all the places that, that there were camps. For some reason, there weren't a lot in the Traverse City area. I don't know why. Um, there were a lot of camps down state, and there were several in the Upper Peninsula where they did the forestry as well. What happened was there were these Liberty ships that were bringing U.S. soldiers and supplies overseas, and they would often come back empty. And so our government had this, had had this idea. We had a labor shortage. We didn't have enough workers here. So instead of bringing them back those empty ships, they decided to fill them with prisoners. You can see a picture of the prisoners in those ships um, and then have them work in our farms and factories. So from 1942 to 1945, there were more than 400,000 POWs. They're mostly German um, who were housed in 500 POW camps located in our own country. So as I learned more and more about these stories and about these people's lives and how they intersected with the lives of kind of your normal kind of American families back here, I started to think more about writing a story. And I knew for those of you who have read it, you know what's written in verse, right? How many of you have read a novel in verse before this one? Anybody? Was this your first novel in verse? Awesome. So um, here's a picture of me with my students who were, who were eighth graders. I would often be trying to get eighth graders to read books. And if I would hold up a novel in verse and say, do you want to try this one? Why do you think sometimes eighth graders might be willing to try a novel in verse? What do you think? Yes, it's a little bit shorter. There's not as many words on the page. So sometimes if we can feel kind of maybe overwhelmed by a book or um, when you pick up a novel in verse, like, oh, I can read that. Like there's fewer words on the page. So what happened to me was I would often try to get my students to read these. And here's the kind of question that kids would come back to me with like, hey, Mrs. V, do you have any more books like this one, you know, with the short lines and short chapters? Or um, I might say to them, maybe try this one. It might seem a little weird at first, like to read poetry, but you'll you'll get get used to it. And I found my middle school students loved novels and verse. And I did too, because they kind of slowed me down. So oftentimes we think about a, bo a book with lots of white space gives you a chance to read faster, but actually it also lets you kind of soak in all of the images and the story it gives you a little more time to think and process. I think a lot of us, like our lives are busy and a novel and verse gives us a chance to, to maybe kind of slow down and think about the words and the language a little bit more. That's why I chose to write a novel and verse. If you haven't read other novels and verse, I encourage you to try some more. These are some, these are some of my favorite ones. Starfish came out maybe a year or two ago. It's done really well. Other Words for Home is really beautiful. Red, White and Whole, Magical and Perfect. Those are four recent ones that I've read that I really like. Um, and all of these authors are really nice people too, because I've met a couple of them. So when I started, it's kind of like anybody, anytime you might have, if you have like an assignment in school and you have to get started, it's hard to start. So I, I told myself, just start with 20 pages. I had 20 pages due and I began with characters. I didn't really begin with a plot. I didn't know what was gonna happen in my story, but I started to have these really clear characters in my mind. I knew I wanted there to be um, a young girl who lived on an apple orchard. And I knew that the German prisoners were getting younger and younger and younger as um, as the war was going on. And by 1944, there were, there were um, German soldiers as young as 15 or 16. So I knew kind of this idea of like two younger people meeting and I knew I wanted the apple orchard itself to kind of be its own character. I wanted, when you read it, I hope you could almost like smell the apple sometimes, or it made you want to eat an apple because it was kind of described in detail. So I'm just going to read you a small section. And some of you who are, who are already reading the book probably know this part. These are the very first um, poems I wrote as part of my project. I didn't know how the story was going to go. But I started, as I learned the stories of these POWs, I started to think of scenes in my head. And the scene that stuck with me is the idea of what was it like the first day that the prisoners arrived? What was it like for, for a girl like Claire to be really worried and kind of uncertain and have these POWs arriving? So you also, um, there are some different 
kind of historical documents throughout. One of them was this U.S. Army Guidelines for Interactions with German Prisoners of War. So before the, the prisoners came, the government would have given the family a note like this. It said, U.S. Army Guidelines for Interactions with German Prisoners of War. Do not try to gain information from a prisoner of war. Do not talk to prisoners of war except the line of duty. Do not ever believe a prisoner of war likes you. He does not. Do not think a prisoner of war will not escape if he can. He will. For those of you who have read the book, does this sound like what Carl is like? No, it doesn't, does it? So it was interesting kind of these warnings. So Claire tells her side of the story. And maybe you notice when you read it that Claire's poems are aligned on the left side of the page and Carl's poems are aligned on the right side of the page. And I did that partially because I wanted you as readers to be able to keep that straight in your mind. But I also kind of wanted to show the way that they were on different sides of the conflict. So Claire, I'm just going to read you the um, poem about their arrival when the German POWs first came. These were the first poems I ever wrote in this book. I'm not sure what I expected. Hard looking men weighed down with chains, feeble, worn torn prisoners, thin with despair, mechanical soldiers with ha hatred blazing in their eyes. I watched from the front stoop as a flatbed truck pulls into our driveway, the back end weighed down by a delivery of Germans. Mama says we shouldn't be staring, but stands close enough that I can feel her warm breath against my back. I count 10 men, the way I count deer when I spot them gathered in a nearby field. The guard is first out. A rifle hangs loosely on his shoulder as if he has no intention of needing it. He strolls the rear of the truck, yanks open the wooden tailgate and turns away, then pulls a cigarette out of his pocket, bends to light it. He doesn't look like someone who is worried about anyone trying to run. I expect to see handcuffs or shackles, but the prisoner's arms and legs stretch free as they climb out of the truck and wait for directions. Tall and lean, cheeks ruddy, clean shaven, Shoulders trained to stand strong. Most look closer to my age than my father's. Several run their fingers through their hair, attempting to slick it back in place after their windy ride. Three lean close together, whispering, grinning, smiling like they have jokes saved up in their pockets. One blonde boy stands apart from the rest of the group. He bites his lip, looking more nervous and shy than fierce and brave. Dressed in blue military fatigues, excuse me, with the letters PW stamped on their backs. They raise their heads, peer out to the trees, glance around at the barns, our house. I can hear the low buzz of their mumblings. Words I know must be German. It's a mean language imitated by kids playing in the schoolyard with wooden guns and sticks or shouted by angry Nazis in the movies. Even from here, their words sound harsh and guttural, like the constant clearing of throats. I've never spoken a word of German, but reckon it would feel like speaking with a piece of hard candy in my mouth. As daddy moves from the barn to greet them, mama yanks my sleeve, urging me back into the house. That's enough now, Claire, she scolds, as if she wasn't right beside me. I close the door behind us. Some of you who are following along, this is on page 48 if you wanted to. <laughs> All right, and then Carl, what did you notice about Carl's side of things? What's included? Yeah. Exactly. They're the German words and then and then the translation. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, good, good point. Yeah. While I was working on, on the book, I found out there were some German words that there's actually not a clear English translation. I thought that was really fascinating. So I picked some of those words to be the titles of the chapters. That's a really great observation. You're, you're the first person ever to bring that up. So smart thinking. You knew that too. Yeah. All right. So the, here's Carl. This is that says, and I don't speak German, by the way. So I do my best to, to say the German words. Unsir uncuffed, our arrival. The truck slows and turns right. A wooden sign in the shape of an apple waves us into an orchard drive. I shiver and cut my hands, exhale warmth into my numb fingers. The driveway forms a T. A big barn towers at its top, a workshed to the right, a dirt road to the left. From where we stand, the land rises before us. Hectors and hectors of apple trees stretch across the horizon. A farmhouse, the owner's place, flanks the driveway's right. A woman and girl, 
probably the farmer's wife and daughter, stand on a front veranda, staring. Both in skirts and cardigan sweaters and nearly the same height, the girl looks like a younger, slimmer reflection of her mother, who stands close who stands close behind her on guard, a kerchief covering her head while the girl's golden hair, tied half up, waves in the morning breeze. Their arms are crossed at their chests. I don't need to be close to see the concern in their eyes. My mind flashes to Moody, my sisters, knowing that, that the little girls I left will be older, taller, harder when or if I return. Like the day I was captured, I want to raise my arms, show this woman and this girl my empty hands. So um, when I think about the story, I think of how I, even though it's historical fiction, which means what? Fiction means what? Those of you who, yeah, go ahead. Fake. We often hear like fiction means fake, right? It means kind of like made up. So even though the story, the characters are made up, I wanted to try to make it as real as possible. In fact, when I was done writing, Claire and Carl were so real in my head that I kind of missed them. Like, it was like I had two friends who suddenly left after I was done done writing. So um, the book, as you know, is set in 1944 in Michigan. Everything in the book is based on Michigan history. So um, there are some scenes like where the um, there's little boys who are shooting like slingshots with marbles at the POWs that happened in, in our state. Um, there are some scenes where maybe the the POWs aren't always getting along and they're arguing with each other. Those are real things I heard from people who um, were POWs in our state. And if you've read the ending, you know that's also based on a true story from Michigan history. So Claire is 14 years old. She lives in her parents' apple orchard. Her brother's in the army, which makes it extra complicated that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, something happens. Yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> Those of you who have read it know what happens. And then um, Claire also, one of her other kind of problems is she doesn't want to do what? She doesn't want to quit school. Yeah, and she, she's under a lot of pressure because most girls her age in her town at that time were told to quit school. And that's also based on a true story because um, I have four grandparents and all four of them quit school in eighth grade because especially my grandmas were told that they were never, that they didn't need to have an education, that they were just going to get married and have kids. So Claire is um, kind of trying to fight against that as well. Carl is 17 years old. Um, he it was captured and um, he was forced into the Hitler youth when he was 10, which is something that all German kids had to be a part of. And if you read the book, you can see how um, what he was taught as a kid really kind of stuck with him. And then as he comes to the US, a lot of those things start to kind of unravel and he starts to ask lots of questions and feel a lot of guilt and shame about um, being part of something that he realizes is really awful. So I love this quote. It says, the, the historian will tell you what happened, but the novelist will tell you what it felt like. So my goal really was, I was learning all this cool history, but I wanted, um, readers of all ages when they read it to think more about what it felt like as well as what happened. These are just some of the sources I used. Um, I mentioned this book by Greg Sumner. I also got to meet Greg and um, I got to hear some stories from people who lived during World War II who, who were still alive and maybe met some of the POWs. Um, I went to a German service that honored some of the POWs who died while they were working in our state. And then this book by Susan Campbell Bartoletti called Hitler Youth taught me a lot about what it was like to be a young German who was living um, under Hitler's kind of reign while, you, while they were young and it impacted what they were taught in school, what teachers could say to them. It's really fascinating. So I encourage you, that's a great book to check out too. It's written for kids. So if we think about Claire's background, Hopefully you um you were kind of attached to Danny, her brother, who she ta he she talks a lot about. Um, she, we know she went to a one room schoolhouse. Um, my uncle actually went to a one one room schoolhouse. This is my cousin Sarah right here. Her dad went to a, a one room schoolhouse for a few years, and he told me a lot of stories about what that was like. And then I also could hear stories from people who are like ninety four and ninety five now, but were little kids when the POWs were on their farms and orchards. So there was a woman who came to one of my very first events. She's 94 and her dad worked with the POWs at my grandpa's orchard. 
which is really interesting to hear those stories. Carl, we know when he was put on that train and, and brought to the U.S., he didn't know where he was going. Um, how do you think he felt when he ended up in an apple orchard? Scared? He was kind of scared at first. When he realized that he was kind of safe and he was being fed, he kind of felt kind of relieved, didn't he, too? Um, I've mentioned about about the Hitler youth and then some of the camps that they lived in. And here's a picture of some of the POWs working on an apple orchard in Michigan. Hopefully you noticed the where I'm from poems at the start. Have any of you ever had to write a where I'm from poem for school? I know it's a common assignment in middle school. I was at a school this week and they were saying that their eighth graders are going to write it later in the year. So you notice that the book started out with the two where I'm from poems. And those are based on George L. Lyon wrote a book or um, a poem called where I'm from. And so both Claire and Carl kind of introduced themselves with the where I'm from poems. So I'm just going to give you a little overview of what it was like to write this book. So I started my first draft on March 25, 2019. How long ago was that? Yeah, four, almost five, almost five years ago. Yep. I finished on February 19, 2021. So it took me how long to write the first draft? Two years. Yep. And when I finished, I sent a text to some friends and I said, you guys, I think I'm just finished writing the first draft of my novel. I'm shaking as, as I write this. I was so excited to have my first draft done. Did that mean I was done write, writing the book? What, what do your teachers always make you do after you write your first draft? <laughs> you have to write a second draft. So I had to revise and revise and revise. So I had a writing coach who worked with me three times. She sent me the, the book back and forth and asked me to change scenes or add things to think about what would make the character stronger. Then um, I was able to get a literary agent who was going to help me try to sell that, that book. But before she was going to send it out to any publishers, she had me revise it three more times. So now I've revised it six times. So six drafts. Then I, um, once the book was sold, I had editor I had to work with. She had me revise it two more times. And then I had a copy editor who double checked my grammar and spelling, but she also found lots of small things with, with historical details I had to make sure were correct. And then I had to make more changes. So I didn't just have two drafts. How many drafts did I have? Yeah, enough that I lost count, right? A lot of drafts. Um, yeah, so it just it just came out and I would say that the that this book that's published is a lot different than that first draft that I thought I was done. So keep that in mind when you have to write a paper and you think you're done after your first draft. Um, do you want to talk about the cover? Seems like especially my um younger audiences love talking about the cover. So one thing I found out is most of the time authors don't get much of a say over the covers of their books. Once you sell that that book, though there's like an art team that takes over. But I kind of begged. I was like, please, I'm a middle school teacher. I think I could maybe give you a little guidance. So I was able to send them some covers that I liked. I thought these were all covers. Maybe you've read some of these other books that have kind of similar themes or some ideas as my book. And I asked for the cover to have something kind of symbolic, like trees with like barbed wire or something that shows kind of a separation between, between people and places. I wanted something nature-based. I was like, I needs to have apples. Um, I want something moody or hinting at conflict, some kind of more natural colors. I wanted the faces to be silhouettes because I didn't want them drawn in because I wanted you as readers to be able to think about what the characters look like. And I wanted it aimed more at a middle school audience. These were the first two drafts they sent me. If, what do you think? A and B. <laughs> uh-huh. B, B looks similar to, to the final, doesn't it? What, why are some reasons you think they picked we and the end picked B instead of A? Yeah. Yes, good. So, so he said that the there's apples. Claire is kind of like almost like hiding, like you can kind of feel her kind of watching from a distance, or she's maybe a little bit uncertain of these guys coming and there's those three guys walking in the background that look a little bit more like POWs they're carrying a flag that's probably like a white flag of surrender yep exactly um so they end up we end up going with B it also has more of the kind of those darker tones of like fall and this is a book about war it, it's kind of sad too so it has more of that feeling 
this is the final draft. What else do you notice has been changed in the final draft? Yeah, go ahead. Just, just, just yell it out. Yeah, different, different types of how the words are made. The, the font we call that. So this is one thing I really fought for is I really didn't care for the font in A and B because I thought it looked a little bit too young and playful and kind of fun. And I wanted something like maybe a little bit more serious and more kind of historical. When I first told them I didn't love the font, they told me too bad. That's the, that's the font that we already picked. But then what happened is they brought it to a team of salespeople and the salespeople were like, we don't like this font. So I was cheering because they agreed with me. And then the font got changed to what it is now. Yeah. So here's a couple of quotes from the book that I think kind of show the themes. If I didn't think too hard or ask too many questions, it was easy. So this is really kind of a book about um, young people starting to think a little bit harder for themselves. And maybe hopefully you saw how Carl um, kind of grew as a person and Claire grew as a person too. Um, I pretend this orchard will hide me forever. You can see that the way that this, like being in that orchard kind of provided Carl time to think about who he really was and who he wanted to be as a person. All right, I'm gonna open up for questions now. I know we also have some questions from a book club that met here at the library, but any of you have questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So I'll try to talk carefully about that because not everybody maybe who's watching online has read the end of the book either, but the end of the book does kind of feel like it comes out of nowhere. That was a hard kind of decision for me to, um, for that to happen, but because it was based on true history, I felt like it kind of shows how war, um, tears people apart. And it also shows maybe a little bit more, um, gives a feeling that like sometimes in war, there's not clear winners and losers. So it did kind of come out of nowhere. And um, I had a young reader who came to me last week and, she, and he said to me, I really love this book, but I really hated the ending. And I said to him, I didn't really like it either. Like there's there's parts of that that make us sad, but also it felt like the right ending to me, even though maybe it was a hard ending. So, yes. Uh, there are some people on Zoom. Yes. They're not, they're not watching you. They're just watching me. I don't think they, they can see your face. No, they can't hear you. That's why I'm kind of repeating things you say in the microphone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that, that was a question that about the ending, I'm going to talk to you more about that afterwards. <laughs> it was, it was really, it was based, it, it was because, um, I learned the story, the, the true story of um, of the ending, and I wanted that to be kind of captured because I think it's a, it was a really sad thing, but I was, it was based on Michigan history. Like that happened to people here. So I wanted people to realize that. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right. Yep, you're exactly right. Smart readers. <laughs> it was a little bit. Yeah. So one kind of kind of interesting thing is there's there's an audio book as well, and I I didn't really know there was going to be an audio book. I was just looking online one day at Audible and I saw my book there. And they, they, they hired readers and they read it. So when I listened to the end too, and I heard those final poems, it was interesting to me to hear how it landed when it's read aloud versus just looking at it on the page. So yeah, in the middle, do you have a question? Yeah, that's true. I've, I played around in lots of different ways um, at the ending, like whether to have a letter or whether to, um, at one point I had Claire as an old woman looking back, but if I did that, I would kind of, um, my publisher would like me to maybe think about writing the sequel. So I couldn't have Claire too old at the end. So no. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> what other questions do you have? The snacks are coming out in a few minutes. Nothing shocks me because I'm a middle school teacher. All the... All of the things that happen in the book still happen in the audiobook. It's just you're hearing it read aloud. It does have two different narr or it's a, actually three different narrators. There's one narr narrator who reads like the the historical documents, the author's note, and then there's one a male narr narrator who reads Carl, and then a female narrator who reads Claire. And the the guy who reads Carl speaks German better than I do. So yes, there's still it's the same ending. <laughs> yes. <laughs> friends in the orchard for a sequel couple yes yeah, so there's a few other questions yeah oh good questions yeah so ernst is kind of the bad guy in the novel and i wanted to, to make sure um, while the POWs came to America, many of them changed their their beliefs and kind of ended up uh, maybe feeling some guilt and shame and not being um, true to Hitler and what they were brought up with. Not everybody did. So I wanted to be clear, like Ernst was the kind of guy that still was supporting Hitler um, and he was a bully. And so I kind of I felt like there, there needed to be a contrast that showed that not everybody was maybe um, changed as quickly as Carl did. And also Ernst does live in the novel. Um, and I think that partially shows like, unfortunately, the good people don't always kind of win in the end. So um, I thought it was maybe a little bit tough that like Ernst was, was kind of like came out of the novel in a better spot than Carl did. But I think it was, it's kind of more meaningful if you think about the way that life sometimes goes. Yeah. You forgot another question here. Oh, that makes me happy. His favorite character was Otto and Otto was Carl's best friend. He was a good guy. I liked Otto too. Yes. Why, why did I make the, make, make the bad guy win? Yeah, I think part of it was like he was he was sent away because of 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 um because of things that that he had done, and so we don't really find out what happens to him later. But it 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 didn't really seem fair, but I think unfortunately sometimes life isn't always as fair as we would hope it would be. Yes. Yes, there was like vi victory day. Yep. Um, at that point, it was that that hadn't happened yet. So, so, so victory day was when the um German troops surrendered. So that's kind of where I decided to end end the novel. The other reason I decided to end it there is because it was May, and the apple blossoms were out, and I felt like that was good, like symbolism and imagery to to end with, with the apple blossoms. I was actually really excited when I found out that Victory Day coincided with when apples blossom in Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other book club questions that we needed to address? Okay. Oh, good question. So why did I write from a Nazi soldier's perspective? I think one of the reasons... Um, I think it was, it's important to think about if I would have only written from Claire's, from, from Claire's kind of perspective, you wouldn't really see that entire story. And I, I definitely wanted people to see that they're, um, I like how much Carl changed and 
what what happened to a lot of the POWs when they came to, to the U.S. was that a lot of what they had been taught as kids, they realized wasn't true. And there was kind of that kind of kind of disillusionment or doubt. And then like there's a moment where Carl really wants to be a good person. And so I feel like that that was accomplished better by showing his actual kind of perspective. Um, and not that, that that was all German soldiers who came here, but it was definitely some of them. And that and 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 that was based on a, a lot of the research I did is what I read. Yeah. Yeah, at the end of the book, the, even though Germany surrendered, the war wasn't quite over all the way. Yes, yeah, so the fighting went. Not, I I'd have to double check all of my dates and sources, but but that but uh, the like the dropping of the bomb in Hiroshima happened later, and I I would have to Google the exact date. I'm sorry, I should have that in my brain. <laughs> I would love to hear from someone else. We heard Otto was his favorite character. Who was somebody else's favorite character? Anyone? One of my favorite characters was Pete, the farmhand. He was kind of based on like a real guy in my life. Pete. Mm-hmm. Anyone else have any final questions? Do you, do you want donut holes? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so um, most of the POWs ended up getting um, shipped back to Europe. Some of them had to stay in like, um, in, like, in like England for a while and do some work or reparations. They eventually were sent back to their homes. Um, but when they got there, a lot of them found out their homes were bombed or gone or their family was very poor. There were some POWs that stayed in contact with the families where, of the farmers where they worked. And there were some, some, a few stories of people actually eventually immigrating back. So um, I know while I was working on the story, there was a man who lived about 20 minutes from me who was living in a nursing home. And he w was a POW who moved back. But unfortunately, he died before I could interview him. Um, but there were some people who moved back to the U.S., yeah, one more question. I'm thinking about making a sequel and it would probably have Claire in it and then maybe some other young, new younger characters who, are, who would be introduced. Do you have an idea for me? I don't have a name for the sequel yet. I have to think about that. It could be a character from the school. That's a good idea. Like maybe one of one of the younger kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. It's fun to talk to so many of you who have already read the book because a lot of my student or school audiences haven't read yet. So thank you for reading or um if you my my email address is on here, Dana.vanderluck at gmail.com. You can always email me questions or write me a note and I'd be happy to write back to you. Okay. So thank you to the library for having me today. I'm super thankful that you had the book club here. Um, if anyone wants um, to buy a copy, um, these are books from, from Horizon Bookstore that um, they're selling. And then I'm also happy to sign books too. I would sign it. Yes, for sure. For sure, I'll sign it. Thank you so much.